Revelation chapter 2, church at Pergamos. There is a... Um, I'm sure I turned... Yeah, I turned it on. Didn't have no, nobody tell me to turn my microphone on. We've been studying about what Jesus told the church there at Pergamos. Let me get my verses up here. In verse 13, he said, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not de denied my faith. And then he says, uh, even in the days wherein Antipas my, was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. One of the things that you see in the book of Revelation you see people there who are saying, the Bible says of them that they love not their lives even unto the death. And I think that marks really what a Christian, a real Christian is. Is that if God takes you through enough trials and troubles and persecution and heartaches, you get to where you don't really care to be another day in this world. You're just ready to go. Go to be with Jesus. Go to live uh, in immortality. Go to live in heaven. And I think God has to do that with all of us because there's part of us, it's in our flesh, it's in our depraved, sinful nature to love this world. And John said in 1 John, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, um, they're not of God. And if we get to where we can't take any more of this world, we're in pretty good shape. But some people, doesn't matter how often they go to church, doesn't matter how many sermons they hear, nothing. They love this world way too much and they're not willing to lose their life because how do we get to heaven? We die. Got to die. And everybody dies. Everybody does. Except, of course, when the Lord appears in the air, there's going to be some that are not going to die. But aside from that, everybody's going to die. So why does it matter if you're saved? Why does it matter when that happens, how that happens? It shouldn't. So those who seek to protect their lives here on this earth shall lose it. Those who seek to lose their lives on this earth shall find everlasting life. And the continuance in faith, we have Antipas here, who, unlike Peter, when Jesus told Peter, you're going to three times, three, you're going to deny me three times before morning, before the cock ever crows, you're going to deny me three times, I guarantee you. Peter got indignant. Oh, Lord, I'll never do that. But sure enough, that's what he did. Why? Because he sees Jesus is fixing to die on the cross. He's not ready to give up and go to be with him. But after Pentecost, there's a different Peter. And Peter tells the Sanhedrin, after they beat him, they said, we ought to obey God rather than the men. We're going to preach Jesus. Doesn't matter if you kill us or not. We're going to preach Jesus. And every one of those original disciples, with the exception of John, died under persecution, were killed, were martyred. John's the only one that we know of that they tried to kill him, according to history. They tried to kill him. They couldn't do it. So they put him, that's why they put him on the Isle of Patmos. That's an, that's an important part of what, I, we're, what we're going to look at this morning. Go to Numbers chapter 13, if you would. Numbers chapter 13. Several years ago, some of you might know, I did this study on giants. That's always fascinated me since I learned of Jack and his beanstalk, which of course is not in the Bible. But, so, and what started it was a guy on Facebook challenged me. He's talking about all these idiots that believed that the sons of God were angels, the daughters of men were human women. And I went, well, that would be me. 
And he, he says, come on, Mike, everybody knows. I said, no, it's not what everybody knows. It's what the Bible says. That's what matters. And so that provoked me to doing a study on it. And, our, and it occurred to me that if you believe Paul wrote Hebrews, and I do, one of Paul's primary principles in the book of Hebrews was based upon the fact that there were gigantic men who towered over everybody else and that the land of Canaan was full of them. Full of them. And I'll show you, I'll show you how that is in a minute. So we know in, in Numbers 13 that Moses picks out one man from each tribe, so 12 men, and he sends them into the land. This is, they've been traveling now for about a year, and they could have, right then, they were at the place where they could have gone into Canaan, right then. But God knew their hearts. And he knew that a majority of these people were not going to make it. He knew it. Even though they had come out of Egypt, they had not yet made it into the promised land and they were not going to either and God knew it. So they go in, they spy the land out. Verse 25, they return from searching of the land after 40 days. When you see that number 40, you know that the gospel is, a gospel is going to be in this somehow, some way. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Verse 26, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sendest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. In other words, God was right. God was right. And that should have been right then and there, that should have been to them a sign that if God was right about that part, he's right about the rest of it. Because God doesn't just give a half truth and then lie about the rest. So they had already discovered the first thing that they said was, God was right. It is a land literally flowing with milk and honey. Look at this fruit. Here's two guys bringing back one cluster of grapes between their shoulders. Carried on this big log. It was that big. And they said, um, verse 28, Nevertheless, that's when they got in trouble. The people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Anak was a giant. Uh, this, I think he was the son of Og, maybe. We know that Og's bed of iron was over nine cubits long, six cubits wide. That is, that is a big bed. That's about 13 and a half feet. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So they're giving them the bad news. These people are huge. Their cities are walled up to the heaven. We can't, there, there's just no way. Caleb, you've got two guys, only two who left Egypt, entered the promised land. Only two. The rest of the people that entered into Canaan with Joshua and Caleb were those who were born in the wilderness. God did not hold that against them. But those who left Egypt, because they refused to trust God to the end, God said, you're not going. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. What were they afraid of? Afraid of dying. Now, I've been, I don't know, for some reason, World War II just interests me here lately. 
And I've watched, I don't know how many documentaries. I've watched the films of Omaha Beach. And the men who, as soon as those end gates of those boats went down into the water, the whole first line of men, those were dead. One guy they interviewed who was still alive, they interviewed him years later. His job was to lower the end gate down, let the guys out, bring it back up so the boat could turn around and go back and get more. He's trying to pull the gate back up. He can't get it up. And the guy driving the boat's cursing at him, yelling at him, saying, get that gate up, get that gate up. We got we to gotta go. We got to get some more. He said, I can't get it up. It was jammed with bodies. Now, these guys knew that. These guys got on the front of that thing for a reason. They knew. We're going to give our lives and we're going to let our comrades use us as a bridge. As bait. So that the guys behind us can get on that beach safely. They knew that. Now, I don't know what I don't know what clicks in a man when he's in a war and he knows he's fixing to get it. I guess something just happens to you. But these guys, we don't have too many guys like that anymore in this country. Different breed of people. But they were willing to give their lives for their nation, for their comrades. They weren't going to quit and they weren't going to hide. And they knew the objective. These people don't want to die as if they're not ever going to die. They don't want to die. The guy that's, that has been leading, I haven't heard much of him lately, Ray Kurzweil. He's invented that piano I play up there. It's a Kurzweil piano. He went to work for Google. And I watched a documentary about him. He's the guy that made the prediction that by 20, what was it, 2049, Time Magazine, the year man will be immortal. And he's been right about a lot of things. And he looks, he's a futurist. And he's a brilliant man. But you can tell this guy does not want to die. He swallows about 200 pills a day. Usually most of them are vitamins and supplements, things like that. He's just constantly just swallowing pills one after another, trying to keep himself healthy. He does not want to die. So he is leading the charge to try to cure all of man's diseases so that man no longer has to die. It's going, they're going to cheat Calvary. They're going to cheat the cross so that man no longer has to die. People are afraid to die. But the truth is, every one of us in this room is going to be laying in a casket one of these days. If not, then the Lord will appear in the air. And so these people, upon hearing what 10 of the spies said, said, uh, we can't go. Why? They were afraid to die. So... Uh, verse 32, they brought up an evil report on the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying the whole land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great statue. There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers. So we were in their sight. And if you take that to be literal, now that's that we are talking about a huge people. So, only two men, and you find out in Numbers that there's a reason why, that Joshua and Caleb were thinking differently. And it's because they had a different spirit in them than the rest of everybody else. But God used this story and the fact that the land was full of gigantic men 
as the basis for what he showed Paul in the book of Hebrews. Now, Numbers chapter 14. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey, were it not better for us to return into Egypt? This is what happens in some people's minds. They, in, they go through a little bit of trouble after they started going to church and they said, well, I had it better off back when I was going to the bar every night. So they go back. Plain and simple, they go back. Verse 4, they said one to another, let us make a captain, let us return unto Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Rebellion is as what? Sin of witchcraft. Rebelling not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Now, Joshua and Caleb and, and Moses is trying to tell these guys, look, we're going to live. We're going to be okay. And you can tell Joshua, you study his life. He was one willing, always willing, even though he was the five-star general, of God's people, he was out on the front line of every battle that they fought. He wasn't hiding in the Pentagon somewhere. He was out there with them. Fearless men. Verse 10, but all the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me, and how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have shewed among them? I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. That's the only time in the Bible you see God ever threatening to disinherit Israel. Okay? That would make them, it, it used to be a legal term, bastard. It's in Hebrews 12. But that meant that you could not receive the inheritance. Verse 13, And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, Therefore, he has slain them in the wilderness. Now I beseech thee. Moses is the intercessor. He's like Christ. He is beseeching God on their behalf to save them. Now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great. According as thou hast spoken, saying the Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times. Ten, ten witnesses, ten times, ten commandments. And what he's telling you is the law and you trying to obey the law will never get you into the promised land. Never. You know why? You've already broken it. And for that, the punishment for breaking the law is death. But Christ has already taken that punishment off of us. It says... Um, 
Verse 23, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me to see it, but my servant Caleb. And here it is, because he had another spirit with him and has followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went and his seed shall possess it. Joshua and Caleb kept the faith. They believed God all the way until they reached Canaan, all the way. They didn't give up. They didn't quit. They didn't say, let's go back to Egypt. Let's turn around. They weren't those who murmured and complained about the manna they were eating. They didn't get bit by the fiery serpents. They didn't side with Korah in the gainsaying of Korah, where Korah said, what, Moses, what makes you think you're, you're the only one that can be in charge? The ground opened up and swallowed Korah, 250 people with him. Joshua and Caleb maintained their faithfulness to what God said to the very end. They believed God's word. Our God doesn't lie to us. And if our God said that that land is ours and that he will give us the victory, then we're going to go as if the victory has already been given. We're going to go. And God blessed those two men who were the only ones who left Egypt to even Moses and Aaron. Moses struck the rock when he was supposed to speak. God showed him the promised land, couldn't go. Aaron's sons offered strange fire. Aaron died before they got into Canaan land. Only Joshua and Caleb and then those who were born in the wilderness were allowed to go in. The rest of them, for every day those spies were in, the, in Canaan, 40 days, a day for a year, they wandered in a circle for 40 years until every one of them perished in the wilderness and they never got to go in. Why? They quit believing what God said. They started out believing what God said when it was time to leave Egypt. But they quit. They gave up. I've been in this church a long time. Seen people come in, seen them go out, never to darken the door of a church ever again. Now, turn to Hebrews. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, let's see here. Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3, verse 7. Paul used that story as the foundation for what he's going to teach here. In Hebrews 3, he's going to tell us, harden not your hearts. Your heart, you can, you can have a stony ground heart. Where your heart turns to stone. And you say, well, I don't believe that. I don't believe, I don't believe the Bible when it says that. I don't believe God said that. I don't believe God meant that for us. Or any, any version of that, you get a, a stony, fallow ground. And you refuse to believe what God said. Just flat out say, no, I don't believe it anymore. So in verse 7, Hebrews 3, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. So we know he's addressing that story in Numbers 13 and 14. That very day that they all decided, make us a captain, we're going back to Egypt. Now, God could have let him, but he said, no, you're not even going to go back to Egypt. You're going to wander in a circle until you die. So verse 10, wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. God swore it. And if God swears it, it ain't happening. And it didn't happen. Take, so now he's going to bring it up to date. You may say, well, that's in the Old Testament. That's not for us. Paul now is going to bring it up to date. 
and say in verse 12, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. An evil heart. Of, see, again, we're not saved by works. We're not saved ever by what we do, did, don't do, have it done. It is not based upon the performance of your flesh in any way, shape, or form. It is conditioned upon your heart. Your heart is either going to believe what God said or you're not going to believe what God said. You're going to refuse. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, 33? Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Jesus talked about the leaven of the Pharisees. And they, they didn't understand that. But then they understood he's talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees. A little leaven then leaven at the whole lump. All the devil has to do is just sow a seed of discord in you. God's word is not true. Or part of it's true. The rest of it is not true. Something, something that you hear, something that you read, something a, a preacher preaches. And all of a sudden you get a stony heart. You get a hard heart. You say, I don't believe that. People have said it. Um, Brother Reg told me he had a family. He preached one time on disciplining children from the Bible. He taught it, taught it very loving, gentle way, taught them how to discipline children. Had a family in his church. And of course, the wife, she had to have her say on the way out the door. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't believe in that. Well, the Bible said it. God said it. And she's like, and that, that was the last time they ever came. And he said, Mike, he just, I just stood there and shook my head. I don't care what the Bible says. Then what are you doing in church? What is it that we, what is it, we're, what is it you're supposed to get here? You're supposed to get a big load of me? You don't want it. You don't want it. It's either the word of God or it's nothing. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter my earth. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily. This is why we, this is why we need one another. It's why we need to come to church. Why we need fellowship. Why we need brethren. You folks online, get with some people, other people online. If you can't find anybody in your area, get with some people online that believe the Bible. Pray for me to say and say, pray for me today, man. I'm having my doubts today. I'm, I mean, I'm weak in faith today. Hey, who has it been? All of us have been there. I've been there. So exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of what's that next word? Sin. That's it right there. That's it. In that parable of the seed and the sower, Jesus said those thorns, which is the lust of other things, the deceitfulness of riches, choke out the word that it become unfruitful. And all of a sudden, because of your sin, because, because you love your sin more than you love God. And I have an illustration for you. A, a guy that I went to Bible college with, he was older than me. He came to me one day. We were cordial with one another, but not really friends. He came to me one day. He said, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah. And so he came in my dorm room. And he said, I just wanted to let you know that I hated your guts. <laughs> what? We, he did. He he said, I thought you were arrogant. I was. He was right. And uh, he said, I come asking your forgiveness. I said, well, you haven't offended me, but yeah. And, you know, we became best friends after that. We did. We did everything together. 
And after we parted our ways, I left that school. Uh, a, a, another friend of both of us who was in my wedding, when he came to my wedding, Craig, said, I got something to tell you. I said, what? And I'll make up a name. I'll say his name was Jim, but it wasn't Jim. He said, Jim confided in me. He, he left the school. I said, really? Because he was training to be a minister. Because he said that um, he started dating a radio DJ. I said, so? And he said, he's a guy. And I went, are you kidding me? He said, no, he never wanted you to find out because he knew you would be disappointed. But apparently that was part of it. He used to tell me about his past, did all kinds of drugs and everything that goes with it. But he never even gave me the hint that he was like that. But apparently he was. And... I made contact with him when I first got on Facebook. I started looking up all these people that I had went to Bible college with and talked with him a little bit. But as I noticed his Facebook feed, sure enough, to this day, to this day, he still is unrepentant, not sorry. Um, what tipped me off was when this gay marriage thing came up for the Supreme Court, he put his equal sign on his Facebook page. And I went, mm. I still pray for him every now and then. But his sin deceived him. His sin deceived him. And he doesn't believe what God said anymore. Uh, let's see. Verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ. And here's that word if again. If we hold the beginning of our confidence. There's that word where we break it down. Con means with. Fide means faith. Fidelity. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. You believed what God said when you knelt at an altar one day where you said, I believe God will give me everlasting life and I believe God will forgive all my sins. You believed that once. You had confidence. You put your faith in that. And now you're saying you don't believe that anymore. You don't believe that God will forgive all your sins. You don't believe, you don't even believe that God has to. You don't even believe in that what you're doing is sin. I've had people, to, I had a guy was admitting to me he was having an affair with the church pianist and said that I believe that God intended for me to be with her instead of my wife whom he had three kids with. So what do you do? Left his wife and three kids. Run off with the piano player. We're, we were supposed to be together. I believe that. I believe God told me. Like, God didn't tell you that. Your sin made that up. Your sin wrote a new verse in the Bible somewhere to where you get to run off with the piano player and it's okay with God. That's what you did. That's what he said. Hold fast that confidence. Steadfast. How long? Unto the end. When Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, in that charity chapter, now abideth these three, faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest of these is charity. Why did he say that? Because faith and hope has an end at some point. Faith and hope ends when we don't need it anymore. Because faith will become sight, hope will become reality for us, and we won't need faith and hope anymore. But until that day, we hold fast our confidence steadfast unto the end. 
While it is said, today if you will heart, hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. And the provocation was Numbers 13 and 14 when they were facing giants in the wilderness and they were afraid to die. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. Only two. Only two. So, when we, when we numbered the Israelites... God numbered them. That's what the book of Numbers is. He numbered the people that came out of Egypt. There was well over 600,000 Israelites. And out of 600,000, two of them. So was Jesus right when he said, straight is the way and narrow is the gate? Or straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and few there be that find it? He was true. For some, when they heard, did provoke. Verse 17, but with whom was he grieved? Forty years. Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses, what, fell? Watch things that fall in the Bible. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? A falling away shall come first. Dagon, Babylon is fallen. Is fall, things that fall in the Bible. Now, just man falleth seven times. But what does a just man do? He riseth up again. We don't let sin, even our own sin, hold us down. We get back up. God's mercy is new every day. He's a forgiving, loving. He's, he's plenteous in mercy. He's plenteous in rod. Okay? Because he'll, he'll whip his children. He'll straighten them out. But God is a merciful God. He would have forgiven. He did forgive Israel, but he said, you're not going in. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. They can't, you can't do it. Second Timothy. That's what I have up on the screen. Turn there. St. Timothy, chapter 3, Paul's instructions to a young bishop that he took under his wing. We know Paul wasn't married, didn't have any children. Timothy, he calls him my son. Timothy, his son in the faith. Paul took him under his wing, trained him, taught him. Loved his mother, loved his grandmother. Knew they were women of godly repute. They were women of faith. So Paul is pleased to turn over this church to young Timothy. And he tells him in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, verse 12, he says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It will happen, and it's probably coming to us, maybe in our lifetime. Maybe. But 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Is that happening now? Yes. Evil men are getting more evil. Seducers are seducing more. They're waxing worse and worse. They are deceiving and they also are deceived. People ask me all the time, do you think these false prophets actually believe the stuff they say? I, yeah, I do. I think they do. I think God has turned them over to a reprobate mind. And that's they, they, they're just like a, a one-tune piano player. Play one song. Give me the money. Give me the money. Give me the money. God will bless you. Give me the money. So he said... Verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. What did he say to Timothy? Continue. Don't stop believing God's word. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith. Not works, through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Then he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So according to this, is there any part of the Bible that we can doubt? No. Is there any part of the Bible that will ever, that will ever be wrong? No. And man, I guarantee you, man's not going to dig something out of the earth 
and prove that God's word is wrong. They're going to try. They do all the time. Oh, look at this. This layer here was laid down 14 million years ago. We know that for a fact. No, they don't know that for a fact. And the, these dinosaurs here, they lived 65 million years ago and man couldn't have lived there. And I can show you tracks that cross one another. Dinosaur tracks and man tracks crossing one another in a creek bed in Texas. Tracks laid down in the mud. Man track and dinosaur tracks crossing one another's path as if they were running from something. Ah, probably floodwaters. Okay? But they can pull out all that stuff they want to. But it's not going to convince me that God's word's ever wrong. My life, my mind, my heart. This book saved my life. Saved my soul. Saved my family. Saved this church. We're not going to walk away from it. What if they kill us? It's kind of what I was hoping for to, be, to begin with. Amen? Let's pray. Father, keep us. Keep us in your faith. Hold on to us. Thank you, God, for choosing us, for loving us, for selecting us, electing us, for loving us and having mercy on us. Thank you for abiding with us, never turning away from us. But thank you also, God, for chastising us, correcting us when we've gone wrong, because we have gone wrong. We've done dumb things, stupid things, things that grieved your spirit. Father, forgive us, but thank you, God, that your word abides, it continues, it keeps going. It's not going to give up. Your word's never going to be wrong. And Father, I still delight, I still delight in finding out things in this book that I never saw before, that I never knew before. I still look, I still ask you questions. I want to know. Thank you, dear God, for giving us such an amazing, amazing book. Help us, dear God, feed us with it, anchor us to it, that we never depart from it. We ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.